Hey guys, welcome back to Anti-Economics and today we're delivering our second podcast on regional inequalities within the UK, hosted by myself, Ravi and Alan. So before we get into it, we're delivering a new segment which is called Tweet of the Week. So basically we're taking the tweet which had the most engagements throughout the past week from our Twitter account, Anti-Economics, if you haven't followed, do so. So the tweet was, why don't they raise the wages of key workers so they can afford the homes? This was in response to the Housing Secretary Robert Jemrick saying that the government is working to give a 30% discount on new homes for key workers. So drop some comments down below, whether you agree with what we said or whether you disagree. Right, so regional inequality. Before we start, uh, I'd like to just read this definition I found online about it. And it's the uneven distribution of income or other variables over different geographical locations. So uh, why do you think it exists in the UK? Because we are one of the most regionally unequal economies in the Western world, Rami. Um, well, regional equality, I think it started, you know, after the manufacturing industry sort of transitioned into the service industry. And um, London, obviously, I think the government prioritised London ahead of the other regions in the UK. And this led to them having a brilliant service-based industry, but led to the other parts of the country sort of lagging behind. Yeah, yeah. No, there, there was a figure um, that I read online where London is actually thirty percent higher in economic productivity and revenue. So it's just a, it's just a very, very um, evident that the inequality exists. And like, it's also like you can think of it as population, you know, historical influence. Like London is like the hub of the UK, and so. It doesn't help uh, in terms of equality within the regions, doesn't it? Yeah, I think especially like when they were doing the transition, there was a lot more government spending put into you know the southern part of the country. Even now today, you know, you've got buildings like the Shah, the Gherkin. There's lots of iconic things in London, you know, making it stand out as the capital, but also as the financial hub, the economic hub of the city. Um, whereas I don't yeah. think the same investment has been put in place in other other parts of the country. Yeah, just on the back of that point, uh, fiscal spending per head in London is as high as £1,456 versus a national average of £891. So it's, it's really evident that, you know, the, the government injections into the regional economy in London is like way higher than elsewhere. Yeah, I think they're definitely... Um, I w- I wouldn't like to say that they're prioritising London, but I think they are to an extent, you know, giving them a bit of a leg up over the other other parts of the country. Even so, with the education as well, apparently there there is, you know, about £1,300 less per pupil at a northern secondary school compared to London, which is obviously quite a large amount of money. And we're looking into the future. Um, you know, these are, you know, future children that should be part of the labour force. And obviously, if we don't give them the same chances and opportunities, there will be inequality amongst the country. I mean, it is kind of like, I don't want to say it's needed, but London does require a bit more attention, but just due to the significance to the to the whole national economy, isn't it? Yeah, I think it requires a bit, maybe a little bit more. But do you think that the gap has gotten too large now? Yeah, no, I think it's rather than the issue of is London getting too much, it's it's more of an issue of are the other regions getting too little? I think that's the issue. Yeah, I think, you know, singling out London as as a major hub is is has its benefits, but also it does mean that other parts of the of the UK economy suffers, you know, in northern areas. But I think some companies like the BBC relocated to Manchester, which led to ITV also relocating to Manchester. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to, yeah Ma- Manchester just just becoming a bit more of a media hub for the UK, which is nice to see. Yeah, exactly. So um, we've talked about the regional inequalities and uh, the Tory government, they actually um, wanted to introduce this levelling up scheme, which is uh, aiming to reduce the regional inequalities around the UK. So like, you know, it entails loads of investments in transport infrastructure. Do you want to uh, just explain a bit about that? Yeah, so apparently they they want to triple investments on transport infrastructure. Um, I believe they're doing this just to in, increase the connectivity between the two parts because yeah, yeah, you know, 
there is there is it's quite a distance to go from somewhere like Manchester, Birmingham, all the way down to London. So the the, the development of the HS2 railway system is um is something that they're trying to do to combat this, I believe. Yeah, uh, no, um, like they've invested twenty seven billion pounds on nearly four thousand miles of road, which uh, I think is just helping to improve interconnectivity between London and other regions. So it's just a bit easier to transition. Yeah, centralized area, isn't it? Yeah, no, I def definitely agree. I think it's a it's a good idea in prospect, but um, the the number question that I pose is: should they have done this a lot earlier? You know, the gap is now quite significant, not just with education, but you know, the social inequality, the housing quality. There's a now wealth gap that's formed. Should this should these you know investments on the transport infrastructure to try and include the rest of the UK being done? You know earlier yeah uh other fiscal investments that they've mentioned is one and a half billion on further education funding around the country they've also um, talked about the emigration of uh, the civil workers out of london and into other midland and northern regions and they're aiming in the long term for twenty two thousand of these employees i think the movement of these civil workers out of London into these northern and middle regions will definitely increase the service industry there and will kind of shift away from the centralised influence that London has. What do you think about that? No, yeah, I think it would be good to emigrate some of the civil workers out of London and obviously HS2 will help facilitate this, you know, providing good transport connectivity. If someone does want to live in London but work somewhere else, you know, they can hop on this train which will get them from A to B. And, you know, it will help diversify the economy and it will help, you know, allow other parts of the UK to have a to have a foothold in the in the UK economy, especially in the service industry. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, obviously, COVID-19 is is a big issue facing the government. And, you know, before this, when the government was elected, one large part of the Tory manifesto was to improve regional inequalities by levelling up uh, yeah. via you know, fiscal injections. But now that the COVID-19 is like forcing Sunak and the whole constituency to focus their investments on fighting COVID, it's kind of um, the, the levelling up is becoming a kind of minute. Uh, what do you think the effects of the pandemic are? In terms um, so the pandemic, I think. It will it will be quite a heavy blow to the UK economy, but I think it will affect the the people up north a lot more than the people um, down south because yeah. Yeah. Um, the quality of life up there is just it is a fact it's just not as good as down down south. You know the opportunities that they receive just aren't there, and now with the UK um, challenging their investment towards trying to support the economy, you know, and not on actually solving this regional divide. It could be, you know, um, it could be a chance for this divide to actually worsen rather than improve. Yeah, uh, like the uh, southern workers, the workers in like London, uh, compared to like, I don't know, the Midlands and the northeastern regions, they actually have more liquid savings and assets that are easily um, dependable on, which means that in the impending financial crisis, you could argue that the the south the south regions the southeast regions of the UK are more fit to handle or weather the storm that's about to come. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think you know up north, the well, definitely we already know that the wages down south are higher than up north. So the people up north yeah. are not going to have the savings and the assets that the people down south do. So um, yeah, I think it will be very interesting to see what actually happens to them in terms of them and their savings, you know, they might they might actually run dry. Then there'll be a lot of families that won't be able to cope with this. Yeah. No, and like as you said before, um the manufacturing industry versus the service industry. Obviously London is hugely service industry. I think it's ninety one percent of its income comes from the service sector. But that's not the case for like areas like Manchester, Leeds, um, where you know yeah. this the manufacturing industry is quite dominant and prominent there. Yeah, it still is, you know, I think it's something that they're trying to move away from, but they obviously, they can't do so, so quickly. Um, yeah. and so do you think the, the pandemic will just widen the inequality a bit more? Because obviously service-based workers, they're able to work from home using their, you know, 
their uh, remote access desktops, but these manufacturing workers who need to go to their their workplace to work to increase their firm's output, they won't be able to do that in the north, and that just further divides the um, the productivity differences between the regions. Don't you think? Yeah, I, I have to agree with that point. That is a, a very good point. How um, uh, you know the, they will suffer more because they're part of manufacturing industry. There's going to be many small businesses up there which are going to be forced to shut because they just don't have the cash balances. They don't have the funds to stay afloat during a time like this. Obviously, the government is offering some support, especially to the self-employed, which they offered out this week. Yeah. But whether this will be enough uh, is is something we'll have to see. Yeah. 100%. And like they're, they're doing lots in terms of the 80% fur, the furlough schemes, the 80% compensation, everything yeah. to target the demand aspect. But in terms of these regions with uh, supply being the main thing affected, I think they do need to focus on some more supply side policies, you know, um, reducing taxation, providing subsidies, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think providing subsidies will be a very a very key one, especially for the businesses. You know, they they will need some sort of incentive to stay afloat, and also for new businesses to start up because we need to replace the ones which shut down eventually. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So I think on that note, it's a good place to end it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. If you have any ideas for next week's, please do feel free to comment down below. Make sure you follow our Twitter and goodbye. See you guys.